In today's episode, we continue to look at how history and folklore can influence our RPG campaigns. Welcome to DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Level up your RPG campaigns by filling yourself with stories and knowledge. Explore topics from archaeology to film history to writing to literature and much, much more. This is DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Welcome to the show. My name is Matt and I am your host. This is the show where we learn how to become better game masters and better role players by filling ourselves with stories and knowledge. Now, guys, I am on a quest and my quest is to find the most interesting, fascinating, informative guests that I can find to help us all become better at this amazing hobby, tabletop role playing games. If you want to support the show or check out my work, head over to DiceGeeks.com and you will find some of the resource books that I write that will help you run your games without spending hours and hours in preparation. My guest and I have a fantastic conversation today, so let's just jump in. I am happy to welcome back Tristan Zimmerman, the writer and game designer behind the Molten Sulphur blog and Molten Sulphur Press. Tristan, welcome back to the show. Well, thanks, Matt. As always, great to be here. We've kind of developed a format here for our episodes, Tristan, so I would really just like to dive in. So your deal on the Molten Sulphur blog is that you write about historical topics or situations or historical events or in sometimes folklore and mythology that then can be used as encounters or campaign seeds or story hooks in people's RPGs. Isn't that right? That is absolutely correct. I remain absolutely committed to the idea that reality is the best source of inspiration, uh, that if you take something weird and wild and cool from real history, real folklore, real science, uh, and then use that as a template to drop something fictional in your game, uh, that what results is something that has a richness and a vibrancy that your players can really appreciate, even if they don't necessarily know that it's grounded in something true. I, I have talked about kind of that same thing a little bit in my book, The No Prep Game Master, where you can just take even just a piece of something, just a piece of a situation, either from fiction or from the real world, and just put it into your game. So you're not like you're not running the the actual book or you're not running the actual historical event, but you just take that situation and especially when those situations come from actual history, uh, they seem to come alive and have kind of a weight and a realism to them that uh, sometimes is lacking in uh, tabletop RPGs. Couldn't agree more. All right. So what we have been doing, we have usually been tackling kind of three situations, events um, that you have written about, and we kind of break those down and talk about how people can use those in their games. So uh, the first one uh, this uh, week is kind of a big one that is always just a fascinating mystery. I think it's one of the greatest mysteries of and possibly of all mankind, and they are megaliths. So why don't you just give us a little uh, insight into megaliths uh, to start with, and then we'll talk about how to use them in our games. Right. So what is a megalith? Um, it, it, it's most fundamental level. A megalith is just a, a big stone. That's literally what the word means. Um, but it is a big stone or collection of stones uh, that have been placed there by human hands uh, in, in the typically ancient hands. And there are megalithic sites uh, all over the world. Uh, it turns out that, that humans uh, kind of universally understand, hey, that's a really big rock over there. You know, maybe if I stood it up on its side, that would be really cool. So you have these, these different megalithic sites uh, all over the world coming from different cultures and different eras. Um, and, you know, different styles of megalithic sites in different places. Um, but we're going to focus here particularly on European megalithic sites uh, because that's what's really uh, captured the popular imagination in the West. You know, people people are, are much more interested in uh, megalithic sites in Wiltshire in England uh, than they are in uh, Somalia, for example. So, you know, focusing in on, on these, these European megalithic sites, um, people have believed a lot of things about different megalithic sites 
down through the years. Um, and some of these beliefs have been grounded in good scholarship and archaeology and a solid understanding of mathematics and engineering. Uh, and some of them have been, you know, not so much that. Um, and I think that, that both categories and everything in between uh, make wonderful inspiration uh, for RPG content. Um, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, Tristan, we all know... Aliens made the megalist. We all definitely, know <laughs> definitely, um, unambiguously. And yeah. and uh, this might be a good time for me to say uh, that I am uh, I'm a, a a pretty skeptical guy. Uh, I am a big fan of standards of of logic and evidence and science. Um, and uh, as a consequence, I tend to find the. <laughs> The, the aliens hypothesis, if we can dignify it by calling it a hypothesis, uh, kind of insulting, right? Like, uh, you know, oh, there's no way our ancestors could have figured out how to use, you know, levers and, and ramps and wedges. That's clearly beyond us. Like, no, we as humans, we're, we're pretty clever. We're pretty ingenious. Um, you know, we're really good at figuring out weird solutions to arrive at pretty spectacular results. And I don't think there's any reason to doubt that our ancestors uh, were just as capable, given limited uh, tools, uh, than, than we are today. And so, yeah, yeah, aliens, eh, maybe less so on, on the aliens, at least where I'm coming from. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no kidding. But um, yeah, I think it is. I mean, you did bring up kind of an interesting point there that I think we do underestimate ancient people sometimes that just because uh, perhaps uh, an ancient people group didn't know much about electricity or internal combustion engines or something uh, didn't mean they were dumb. <laughs> they, they knew uh, they knew a lot of things. And um, uh, I think some of these, you know, I think why kind of the mystery around megalithic sites, and of course you mentioned uh, uh, in England, which would be probably one of the most famous in the world, and that's Stonehenge. Um, I, I think, of course, what makes them such a mystery to us is that they were created in prehistoric times, meaning there was no writing or, well, writing that we know of uh, at those times. So we just don't know what exactly they were put there for. Um, they were so, you know, a lot of these sites are impossibly ancient, <laughs> like they're, you know, getting to the point of being ridiculously ancient so that we don't know what they were doing. So we are left with kind of archaeology and in some cases just scant clues as to why um, these uh, these stones would have been erected, why they take the shape of circles in a lot of cases, um, you know, were they, you know, <laughs> you know, were they used for astrological, uh, you know, uh, astronomy, were they used, you know, for all these different things, you know, and people are just, we're just left to really just speculate about them so much. Yeah, absolutely, and particularly when you you bear in mind that in a lot of these cases, uh, these sites have been in uh, maybe not continual use, but on again, off again use for literally thousands of years, uh, which means that. Uh, you know, for example, just to run with the Stonehenge example, uh, when the Romans showed up, yeah, their Stonehenge was absolutely there, but Stonehenge was built thousands of years earlier by a people that were a different people from the Britons who were in Britain when the Romans arrived. And so, you know, it, there, there was this, this popular idea in in, in, in Britain, in the Victorian era, that, oh, well, Stonehenge and, and sites like it, because there are a lot of sites like it in, in Britain, uh, must have been built by the Druids, because Julius Caesar writes about the Druids, and he got there first, right? I mean, it was the first person to get there and write it down. Technically not true, but, you know, neither here nor there. Um, so must have been them. And, and no, no, you've got thousands of years of, of non-history, of a history, of prehistory predating that. And that leaves a very muddled and complicated archaeological record, uh, not least because stones aren't very forthcoming. Um, you know, you and I, we live around the corner from uh, the Kaukia Mounds, um, uh, archaeological site. And whenever I visit Cahokia and, and read about it and learn about it, something that always blows me away about Cahokia is there are some things that we know in extreme 
extraordinary detail. And there are some things that we know literally nothing about. And so there are some categories of things like diet, for example, that archaeology can deliver absurd quantities of information about diet based on, on things like isotopic ratios and wear patterns in teeth. And, you know, you can just get like, oh, this guy ate a little bit of this kind of grain, you know, the Tuesday before he died, almost to that level. Oh, what was his name? Oh, we have no idea. Like, and we will never know. It is literally unknowable to ever know any proper noun ever associated with the skeleton. Um, and stones fall in the latter category, right? There's, a, there's very little information that you can glean from a stone. And yeah, it's this, this big, it's this big, wonderful blank spot that people down through the ages have loved to project whatever they wanted to believe upon. You know, and you did mention the Cahokia site, which was phenomenal. I think they believe that they had a wood hinge that they called it here. But, you know, uh, of course, the the wood deteriorated. So we were only left with a a little bit of of archaeological kind of evidence for that. But then with the the wood hinge, like an amazing category of like, wait, you can learn that? Like, the fence, the, the the post rots away, so you'd be like, well, we'll never know, right? Like, yeah. it's gone. It's gone forever. Nope, negative, because when the hole fills in over time, it fills in with a slightly different soil than mm-hmm. the soil that was around the post hole. So we know exactly where the post was. We know how big it was. We know how deep it was. In many cases, we can know what kind of timber it was. And it's just sort of like, wait, what? We can know that? How is it even conceivable that we could know that? And the answer is, archaeologists are very good at their jobs. Yeah, but then what was its purpose just right. <laughs> completely eludes us. <laughs> and so if you were someone who, who lived there and was actively using it, the idea that in the future, like somebody might know like, Hey, here's what kind of wood you use and here's where you put it. Oh, okay. So presumably they must know a lot about the, the religious rituals that we did here. Oh, absolutely nothing. Literally nothing. <laughs> Yeah. And now I know, you know, kind of over the the years and that a lot has been speculated about the uses of these megalithic, you know, structures or circles. A lot of cases, it's circles. Um, In many cases, it's circles. Uh, And so we get things like, you know, marking the solstice, you know, the tracking, you know, the marking the equinox and all kinds of different things like that. But uh, there are some beliefs Uh, let's say, that might just be out there that would probably work better in a role-playing game, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, So, you know, heck, let's get started with uh, with Kalanish. Uh, So Kalanish is a site in in the Hebrides. The Hebrides are the the great mess of islands off the western coast of Scotland. Um, And the the stones at Kalanish um, are... First off, they're, they're a really unusual and, and, and remarkable plan. Uh, it's two perpendicular pairs of parallel lines uh, that form a cross. So if you think of somebody drawing the outline of a cross uh, and how that would kind of form two parallel lines going up and down and two parallel lines going across, that's how Kalanish is set up, just with these really tall, skinny stones. Um, and... Before excavation, the the stones didn't really look tall and skinny. They looked kind of short and unremarkable. But that's because uh, five feet of peat had grown up around the stones. So when archaeologists showed up at Kalanish in 1857, started doing an excavation, the first thing they had to do was cut back the peat. It's like, oh, oh, I guess these stones are a lot taller than we realized. Uh, So I just love the idea in a role-playing context of like, hiding a dungeon or the markers of a dungeon in that way. Like you show up and it's like, Oh, there's a couple little bitty stones here. You know, there's, there's a hole. Maybe if we go in there, we'll find some goblins or whatever. But it turns out that those stones are actually very, very tall and remarkable. Just most of the stone has been buried by time. Uh, and actually what you're dealing with is, you know, the, the, the lost tomb of some grand King and you go in there and you're totally over your head. I don't. I, I couldn't remember if I had heard of uh, if of that one before reading about it on your blog. But that one is just a fascinating site. And of course, you know there is 
uh, the idea of a kind of a megalithic structure being the tip of the iceberg of some other ruins. And of course, the the easiest thing to put under a bit of ruins that's sticking out of the ground is a dungeon. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. It's very convenient. <laughs> yes, very convenient. Um, but there are some other kind of wilder claims about some of these sites, yeah. aren't there? Absolutely. So uh, in Kalanish, uh, you, you get some some weird ideas that have, have jumped up around Kalanish. Uh, one, um, there, one of the, the, the things that, that you often see with uh, folk beliefs about megalithic sites is that the stones are some person or creature that was transformed, that was turned to stones. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so in Kalanish's first mention in print, which happened in 1680, uh, the author claims that the locals believe uh, that the stones were, were men turned to stone by an enchanter. Uh, and then there's there's another tradition that the stones were originally giants uh, who were turned turned to stone uh, by the faith of St. Kieran. Um, the, the giants had gotten together into a meeting to, to plot how they could oppose Christianity. And St. Kieran shows up and boop, all the giants are turned to stone. And now it's Kalanish. And um, there's, there's another belief that I wasn't really able to track down how old it is. It's just sort of, it's, it's one of those things, whenever you start looking at, at something like megaliths or aliens or one of those things that, that, that New Agers and pseudoscientists have gotten their claws into, um, when you start digging around, what you tend to find is the same couple of sentences or paragraphs kind of copy pasted over and over and over. And maybe in this book, it's written a little differently, but it's very clear that they're all drawing from the same source and they're all drawing from each other. And none of these sources are properly sourced and like, so who knows how old this claim is, but uh, there's, there's a a claim of a, a quote, shining one, close quote, uh, who, who walks up the site's the, 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 the main avenue of Kalanish, the long end of the cross, um, summoned by the call of the cuckoo and wearing a cloak of feathers. Um, and uh, if, you, if you're at Kalanish and you look around, there's a, a range of hills off to one side uh, that looks kind of like a sleeping woman. Um, and she has been uh, she has been affectionately named by the locals, and I apologize for the terrible mispronunciations uh, here. But the 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 Kalich na uh, the the old hag of the moors, because the hills look like the profile of a woman sleeping on her side. And there are some New Age beliefs uh, that she may be connected to the site, uh, but of course, there's no documentation that any of of the beliefs in in the Kalich uh, predate. Uh, predate the the modern era. So if you have a a campaign setting where beliefs can become true, um, the Kalech might really be real, but you might be a new spirit but maybe one who believes falsely that she is an ancient spirit. So you, you might be able to, to kind of play with that. Uh, and then my, my last, my last weird belief from, from Kalanish and, and then I'll, I'll drop it uh, is about half a mile Southwest of the site. Uh, there is a small stone circle, as you mentioned. Yeah. A lot of c- circles are a popular form for megalithic sites. Um, and one of the stones is covered in cracks. Now, it's not terribly surprising. Uh, stones do crack. This is a, a, a known thing. Um, but in 1858, somebody wrote a paper uh, that tr- was trying to decode the cracks as being an intentional script that someone had written on the stone and it looked like cracks, but really it wasn't cracks. Uh, and, you know, maybe it's the Ogham script of the, the medieval Irish. But, uh, of course, it, it just was cracks. It, it was nothing but. But that then presents us with this you know, really exciting idea of um, what if cracks in megaliths are some secret form of writing? You know, what if instead of sending your PCs off to the library to try to find the, the piece of information that they need, instead you they have to go out onto the moors and find, you know, the, the, the one menhir. A menhir is a, 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 a tall, skinny standing stone. They have to find the one menhir that has the cracks on it that that encode the writing with the secret to bring down the big bad. I think I'm going to add that to a campaign like uh, this week. (laughs) 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 No, that is – I I think that is actually uh, really cool that, um, yeah, instead of, you know – how many times have I had my party go to a library when you could have them uh, track down a uh, standing stone uh, someplace else and uh, figure out 
a part of the puzzle. I think that would be, uh, I think that would be fantastic. And, um, uh, uh, you know, I know we're going to get into a few more because I could talk about megaliths all day because megaliths are awesome. But I did want to say, you know, you know, we have been talking a lot about D&D and I think, you know, the Standing Stones, of course, they work for Dungeons and Dragons or any other fantasy setting RPG, like right out of the box, right? Like, I mean, you don't even have to change much. Like you mentioned the old hag. I mean, that's a, that's an adventure. I mean, that the name translated is like a title for an adventure, like right, like right there. So like, you don't even have to change much. But uh, of course, I, I know, you know, with them being circles, there's always uh, what I always thought was a, a fascinating idea is that they can be, of course, portals to other worlds, right? Absolutely. You know, or dimensions or, um, you know, uh, whatever you are trying to um, you know, whatever you're trying to accomplish. If you have modern day characters, they can be transported to, you know, kind of a Edgar Rice Burroughs style Mars by visiting, you know, picnicking on the, you know, in Stonehenge on the solstice or whatever, right? That's, that's their adventure hook uh, to go into a, a sword and planet adventure or, or even just a, a straight fantasy or into a far flung science fictiony world kind of a la Stargate SG-1 and things like that. Yeah, and it totally works for any any modern setting as well, right? Because I don't know if you guys in the listening audience have noticed, uh, but the Standing Stones haven't gone anywhere, right? Uh, <laughs> turns out stones really stick around. Uh, you can visit the Molten Sulfur blog for more uh, profound insights like stones tend to stick around. Um so if you've got, you know, your, your, um, your Dresden files or your uh, urban shadows or your unknown armies or some other kind of modern setting with a little bit of a supernatural, uh, World of Darkness, of course, and, you know, that escaped me. Yeah, the, the Standing Stones are right there, right? But, like, you can use them with the exact same nonsense and excitement that you would use in a fantasy RPG, but it slides perfectly into a modern day game. I mean, there's just so many different ways that you could use them in fantasy, in, you know, modern day, in kind of a traditional 20s and 30s Call of Cthulhu. I mean, they're ancient, you know, but beyond ancient. Well, all you have to say is, well, actually, Stonehenge is not, you know, whatever it is, uh, several thousand years old. It's actually a million years old. What? And it was, you know, and it was made by whatever, you know, the lizard people, whoever, whatever it is. And, uh, you know, the reptile race that came before us that disappeared long ago or whatever it was. And, uh, you know, I mean, it, they just work for everything. And um, even science fiction, I mean, if you're in the far future, of course, you start finding them on other planets and they make a star map and they lead you to, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, some certain, you know, lost planet that has some treasure or something on it. I mean, uh, the stone circles, they just, they just give, they just always give. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, you know, you, you did have a few other places. Do you want to mention Karnak or? Um, Sure. Uh, I'll do uh, Avebury real quick. Uh, Avebury, oh, okay. I, can, I can knock out fast. Okay. Um, so Avebury is uh, kind of around the corner from Stonehenge. Um, and it is so, it is the largest stone circle in the world. It's so big uh, that there's a village that partially sits inside of it. Um, and as a, as a consequence, um, much of the, the stone circle is actually a recreation because a lot of it got knocked down in the early modern period so people could build houses where these inconvenient stones were located. Uh, and then in the, in the 1930s, uh, people were like, oh, maybe, maybe we shouldn't have done that. Like, maybe we had something special going on here and let's, put, let's go find some new stones and, and put them up and, and try to rebuild this. But there have been some, some really weird beliefs that have sprung up around, around Avebury. Uh, one is... Uh, that the, that Avebury is at the site of a crossing of fields of male and female energy uh, that are following the Michael Ley line. Now, of course, dowsing and male and female energy and Michael line and Ley line, none of that is real. All of that is completely unsupported by actual evidence. But um, what... Just uh, stick in the mud, Tristan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm not at all sorry. Um, but... Um, so, so what the, the Michael line is, is if you draw a map of, of all these different, you know, cathedrals and churches and holy sites dedicated to the, the Archangel Michael, um, supposedly you can draw a line uh, that sort of 
connects them and goes is is really long and like to a certain extent that is technically true right you can draw that line and it will like come very near a lot of michael related sites the issue of course is the archangel michael is kind of a big deal and so there are a lot of sites devoted to the archangel michael and so congratulations you have managed to draw a line through you know this this big mass of dots and like good job your line does in fact come near to a number of dots but what about all the other dots like oh we don't worry about those those don't count like you can't do that that's not how science works anyway um you also have this uh this th there are two stone circles inside the primary avebury circle so if you think kind of like the, the the yin and yang symbol how it has those two circles within it kind of like that but without the interlocking teardrop shapes and one of those interior circles uh, the stones are spaced apart pretty much the same distance that they are spaced apart in the outer circle um now how how could the the ancients have done this well they could have had some stakes and a, and, and a piece of rope, right? Like, okay, we're going to put a stick in the ground, we're going to measure it off with a piece of rope, and we're going to put another stake in the ground, and next week we'll come back with the stones and we'll put the stones where the stakes are. And as long as you're using the same piece of rope to do both the outer ring and one of the inner rings, like, ta-da, you have managed to do this. But there's some people like, oh, man, this means the people who built Avery, like, they could work with Pi. They were able to do these complicated calculations. like. No, man, it's probably just a stake and, and a single piece of rope. But what you, if you set an adventure, and it could just be like a murder mystery or some other like completely normal adventure, and you set it in a town based on Avebury, that then gives you the excuse to have the relevant NPCs in this adventure be like dowsers and pie conspiracy theorists and crackpot mathematicians and all of this has nothing to do with the actual adventure but like boy all of a sudden your boilerplate uh your boilerplate murder mystery is going to be a lot more memorable because of the really memorable characters that are involved in it and i hesitate to to advocate for the use of intentional red herrings in investigative mysteries, right? I am very much of the idea of don't introduce actual planned red herrings. Your players will do that on their own. They will seize on weird details that you didn't intend to mean anything. They'll be like, but what if this is the key? And you're like, no, man, it, like I invented the barman on the spot. Like I promise he's not the murderer. <laughs> yeah. um, unless he is like, unless you're that level of improvisational GM. So I just I'm not rolled saying, on. Oh, I just rolled on a random table for his name. It wasn't planned. It, wasn't <laughs> <laughs> it was not planned that his name is, you know, Satan, the bad guy who murders people. Like, it just worked out that way. Um, but anyway, so I'm not saying, like, go ahead and set this all up as an intentional red herring. But, hey, your players will probably seize on some element of this as being a red herring. Like, oh, how did the ancients reach through time to kill these people using the power of the mathematical concept pi? And uh, yeah, I think it'll make for, for a, it'll, it'll take what would otherwise be a pretty boilerplate adventure and suddenly make it like really memorable. I loved reading about this one too, because, well, I mean, first off, just the idea of the stone circle being so big that an entire village is built inside. I mean, that just opens up like I was saying before, these just keep giving ideas. Like they just give you ideas, like just constantly, because my first thought was, well, you mentioned too, that they were tearing some down to build houses. So well, that feels so, like a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. It was a terrible mistake because that ring around your village was protecting your village from something. Right. And so some jerk who wanted to build a bigger living room pulled out one of those stones and now it doesn't work. And here are all these creatures or something that are attacking the city or, you know, or the, the village. Or now that one of the stones has been removed, your village is being transported to a different planet or to a different reality or back in time or, or to the far future. You know, I mean, these just keep giving. And they work in anything. I mean, fantasy, uh, Victorian era, you know, the 1920s, 1930s, uh, Vietnam era. I mean, you could probably make it work somehow. I don't know. You could just make it work. Um, or, you know, modern, uh, you know, near future, uh, you know, far future. These things just keep giving. And um, uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I just think it's fascinating. Yeah, 
Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, if, if somebody were to come to me after this recording and be like, actually, Tristan, there are, you know, significant megalithic sites in Vietnam, I would not be remotely surprised, right? Like, they've got stones in Vietnam. They've got people in Vietnam. Sure, people erected big stones. Like, why not? Hell yeah, throw that in your Vietnam War game. And why not just have one there, right? I mean, talk about finding something in the jungle, right? I mean, that would just be amazing. Yeah. Um, uh, and and like I said, I mean, there's just so many ways to use them. Uh, I mean, seriously, a village encircled by stones. I, if there's not a campaign setting or something written about that already, I mean, it should totally be written because that is just, uh, like I said, I mean, in Dungeons and Dragons, it's just like ready-made. <laughs> it's just like a ready-made, you know, for whatever uh, you are trying to do, whether it's protecting the village, whether it is harming the village, whether um, uh, the the old, you know, evil wizard who made it in, you know, a thousand years ago is now been managed to resurrect himself and he's coming back and he's like, why did these stupid farmers build a village <laughs> between my magic circle? I'm trying to conjure the Kraken or whatever it is, you know, and, you, it, you know, whatever, you know, there, there's just no end to the idea. Right. Like, there's just no end. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, and so there's that one. You said that would be a quick one. But I mean, my goodness, you could get a ton out of that. And then, um, yeah, I mean, we barely even brushed over, you know, uh, Stonehenge, uh, which is could be mine for a, a ton of ideas as well. Uh, then there's also Karnak. Can you kind of explain Karnak? Yeah, so uh, the thing that Karnak is best known for uh, is, I, I mentioned Meniers. Meniers are, are tall, skinny standing stones. And uh, Karnak is, is best known for miles and miles of parallel lines of Meniers, right? Like, just just like like lined paper, except instead of, of a line on a page, it's just a line, uh, a miles long line of standing stones. Um, and, you know, yeah, of course that's what Karnak's going to be best known for. That's amazing. Um, but the, the, the wild stuff for me uh, is one particular thing. So there, at Karnak, there's just a whole mess of megalithic sites. Um, but there is a cairn, a tomb, and a dolmen that all share a piece of the same stone. A dolmen, for the record, is, is when you have, uh, is, is a stone table. You have a, a big flat piece of stone uh, supported on uh, three smaller pieces of stone, like uh, three or four, uh, like a table leg. Um, and it's usually big enough that, like, you can walk under it or you can crouch and walk under it. Um, but these three, these three things, the, the cairn, the dolmen, and the, the tomb, all have the same, like, pieces of the same carving. So, you know, the, the carving starts on the top of the dolmen and continues right up to the edge of the stone and then picks up, resumes, you know, over there, maybe a hundred yards away or half a mile away or however far it is, on one of the big stones that makes up the tomb. And then it gets to the end of the rock there and it picks up in the cairn. And um, what, what had happened was, um, this used to be one single menhir, but a menhir that is 15 meters tall. So 45, 50 foot tall menhir that the folks who erected it, or maybe somebody who came after went ahead and put carvings on it, showing, you know, animals and abstract designs. And then at some point the menhir fell over. And when it fell over, it broke into three pieces and people were sort of like, well, waste not, want not. It did break into three pieces, but it was an enormous stone, so now it's merely three very large stones. Let's go ahead and incorporate this into uh, the things we're building now. And what's so nuts to me about that is that means that in real life, existing megalithic sites that you can visit today may be made from the remains of even older and grander sites. You know, this is something that, that humans always do whenever we have uh, a stone building that falls into ruin, no matter how grand, somebody will always say, well, I, I was looking to make an addition on my kitchen. And, you know, it's expensive to go quarry stone, but somebody already went ahead and quarried all the stone to build that big building over there. So I'm just going to steal the stones from over there. And yeah, man, 
like prehistoric people did that too. They did that with their their older megalithic sites. And so that means in, in your fictional context, you could have a, a modern megalithic site, whether that's modern in the sense of like it's in the Lord of the Rings universe or whatever, um, that may be affiliated with multiple distinct eras of phenomena. So, right, maybe that was erected 3,000 years ago and there are there are ghosts of the people who built that site still haunting the stone circle or whatever. But then those people took the stones from an even earlier and larger and grander site that was erected by lizard people 10,000 years before that. And then the lizard people scavenged the stones from something that was even grander and bigger that was built by the Yithians 65 million years ago. And so, you know, now that the, you got the ghosts, but then you also have the lizard people popping up out of the soil and being like, ha ha, we're back to lizard around. Oh my God, what have you done to my house? And then the Yithians are traveling forward through time and they're like, oh, we put so much work into this. We're really grumpy that you people are vandalizing our stuff. And you can kind of squeeze multiple eras of weird phenomena into a single site. Yes, that this one stone would have fallen over and then they they used it um, to build other ones. I, I think that is a, a fantastic, um, just a detail that will make some of your players go, wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, our our dungeon master's a genius. He like he like worked all this stuff in. You know, um, there's also a story about Karnak, isn't there? Where um, is it like once a year that the stones turn back into giants and they go down to like the river or to the sea to get a drink, and then it reveals pits of like huge like treasure underneath. But anybody who tries to go there, like they'll start collecting it, and then it's so much treasure that they get greedy and they keep correct you know collecting it until the morning it becomes morning again and then the stone appears over top of them killing them and so nobody ever gets it because they get so uh, uh fascinated with like the lust of gold uh i had not heard that i love it i would yeah. totally use that yeah i heard that in something i can't remember where i heard it i mean it could be just totally been where i heard it somewhere so i didn't make it up but i heard it somewhere it could be total fiction though but it is a fantastic kind of folklore uh idea and i mean that presents a ton of adventure hooks as well obviously you got to get the treasure out from underneath the standing stone or you got to prevent the the treasure from being taken um you know uh whatever it is i mean that that is, uh, there are so many stories around megaliths. I mean, it is just, uh, it is just absolutely incredible. And um, I, I think, you know, you are definitely on to something there uh, that, you know, these could be used in horror campaigns. These can be used in, uh, I mean, I don't know. You could just, just give me the, the you know, the, the most off the wall setting. And it's just like, yeah, megalith will work. <laughs> and now did you have some stuff on Stonehenge as well? So um, the the primary cool stuff, gameable stuff that that uh, I scrounged up on Stonehenge, uh, has to do with um, with the origins, with who supposedly built it. So um, in in the in the, the 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 history of the kings of Great Britain, a text written in the year 1150 by Geoffrey of Monmouth. Mm -hmm. um, Accord, according to, to, to Joffrey, uh, Merlin built Stonehenge, and he did it using gears and giants. Um, the, uh, the, the 1600s architect Inigo Jones, a, a major British architectural figure, made a lot of really beautiful uh, pieces. Uh, he argued that it was built by the Romans, uh, that when the Romans arrived, there was no Stonehenge, and the Romans built it. Uh, and as, as I mentioned, at, at, at that time, uh, people believed it had been built by, by Druids. That was an unpopular opinion. Um, and uh, the, the antiquarian William Stuckley uh, in the 1700s uh, argued that Stonehenge was being built by the Druids, um, but that these weren't any old Druids. These weren't, weren't Celtic pagan Druids. These were Christian Druids who, uh, even though Christ had not yet been born, these Christian Druids had learned the true religion uh, from biblical patriarchs who had visited England long ago to teach true Christianity. Uh, and the Druids were like, yep, that's how that makes a lot of sense. We're in on that. We're going to go ahead and build Stonehenge about it. And, uh, you know, that's that's all all cool. And But then we, we, we come to, and, and this guy, this guy, is, he's an astrologer. He's not an astronomer. He's an astrologer. His name is Robin Heath. Um, and I don't think he was 
trying to imply stuff about the builders of Stonehenge, but boy, did he succeed, whether he was trying or not. Um, because he did uh, some really delightful coincidence hunting. Um, the, 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 the outer circle... Uh, I think it's the outer circle at Stonehenge is, is called the Sarsen Circle. It's about 328 feet uh, in circumference. And uh, wouldn't you know it, uh, 12 lunar orbital periods is about 328 days. Um, now, obviously, you're just going around looking for things that happen to line up because the builders of Stonehenge were not using modern feet. Um, in fact, the, 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 the length of a foot... Uh, while well, the foot is a relatively old measurement, uh, the length of the foot has varied considerably over um, over time and space. And so if uh, if it happened to line up, like, no, it's 328 feet, just like it's 328 days, that implies that the, 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 the people building Stonehenge, if that was intentional, that they had the modern foot, which means either they were time travelers who traveled forward in time to get their hands on modern tape measures. Or it means that the length of the foot has been like intentionally set at least twice by some being, maybe God that, that, you know, persists through time and was able to say to uh, the ancients, no, 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 you want to use a foot. A foot is exactly 12 inches. You know what? Tell you what, here's a stick. This stick is exactly one foot long. Remember that. And then was able to travel forward to the standardization of the modern foot and be like, hey, mister who's establishing the the modern foot, like, no, no, no. It needs to be exactly this long. You know what? Here's a stick. This stick is exactly one foot long. Like, use this. And uh, this 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 astrologer also did some some hilarious noting with um, you know the, there there's a farther out circle named the Aubrey Circle that its diameter now is ten thousand seven hundred and eighty six inches, and if you multiply the length of the solar year by the length of the lunar month in days, you get ten thousand seven hundred and eighty six. So you know obviously this is the result of just trying every conceivable combination of phenomena until you happen upon a number that matches up with one of the, you know, list of 45 numbers that you derive from the various diameters and circumferences of different things in the site um, measured in, in different units. But again, I love the idea of like, no, inches too. Inches are also, just like the foot, the inch uh, is, is, a, is, is a, uh, either a magical thing that was set by God or that it's the result of time traveling ancient builders and so cool we've got a whole bunch of different origin stories for who built stonehenge why can't they all be true uh so in in your setting if you've got like a stonehenge analog um you can have brawling in the streets of the nearest town merlin and his giants romans christian druids time travelers with modern tape measures and then like, I don't know, God himself with his stick of exactly one foot long, um, duking it out over who gets to build Stonehenge because they all have a claim on it. Yeah. And a lot of people have tried a lot of things, but um, all I really know is that time traveling megalith builders is like my, is going to be the premise for my next screenplay or something. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's not a bad uh, band name. You know, it's not. Yeah, it's not a bad band name. Okay, well, I'm gonna have to use that for something. I don't know what yet, but I'm I'm gonna use that for something. That's pretty good. (laughs) Yeah, so obviously, there's a lot that people can can use here with Stonehenge. I mean, we've talked about you know, a, you know, if you're in the modern world, it can be a portal someplace. Um, and of course, like what you were just saying there with a lot of these people who are trying to, you know, add different kind of, you know, I guess you would possibly call them s- almost spiritualism <laughs> type things to some of these objects that we just have, you know, no idea about. I mean, that does open up, you know, I, I mean, it opens up a whole thing for, um, 
you know, cults. It opens up for modern, you know, mo- modern type treasure hunts that could be, you know, actually based on some of, uh, you know, some of those inches and feet, even though, you know, obviously you explained why uh, that would be a little hard to believe. But if you're in a fictional world anyway, you know, let's use some of these, um, you know, some of these measurements to put people to find a treasure someplace um, to track the moon to where, you know, the moon aligns with the stone, the sun aligns with a stone to reveal something. I mean, that's a fairly, you know, kind of known trope, but it could also be that, you know, every certain, you know, maybe, you know, million years, the moon actually, you know, this is tracking the moon's orbit to where it leaves uh, the, the Earth's orbit for a little while. And we just haven't seen it because we haven't been around for a million years or whatever. Uh, I mean, it just opens up, uh, I, mean, I mean, just a world of possibilities. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I mean, obviously, we could keep going because I, I love I love Megalus, and I, I have done uh, or I've tried to do some you know a lot of reading on Megalus as well. And uh, I, I just think you know, kind of as we covered, just to recap just a little bit, you know, whether you're running fantasy, whether you're running you know uh, Victorian era steampunk, or whether you're running uh, you know modern day whether you're running, um, you know, something in the far future, um, there is always uh, some way to use a megalith. And, you know, we didn't talk about far future too much. I uh, talked about a little bit about like kind of Stargate ideas, but I mean, there's always um, a possibility that it was aliens. The aliens are still out there. I mean, those could work into a far future game. Uh, they could be landing sites, of course, for ships that had visited Earth. Um, there is just, a, you know, like I said, just an endless kind of, uh, you know, uh, supply of, of um, ideas. You know, well, if you're running far future again, I guess this could be one. You could find something on an alien planet that leads, that leads people back to Earth to kind of get uh, you know, maybe a group of far future travelers who've only heard of Earth, um, you know, uh, maybe not exactly Battlestar Galactica, but uh, a little bit more like maybe one player characters from Earth and the others only heard about it. And then you you want them to bring them back to Earth to visit Earth for some reason. And you can draw them back by planting clues to Stonehenge's origin on a far flung planet somewhere. And uh, they have to come back to Earth to uh, put together the uh, puzzle that saves the galaxy from uh, imploding or whatever it is. I love it. <laughs> uh, so do I. I may I may write some of these down, Tristan. I may write some of these <laughs> down because uh, these are really cool. Uh, these are really cool. And of course, you know, uh, Dungeons and Dragons has played with this right in Curse of Strahd. There are stone circles and megaliths, but they, they're kind of left as a mystery, right? And uh, I think the writers did that, you know, uh, on purpose because, you know, in the real world, right, these are still mysteries to us. Even, mm-hmm. you know, even archaeologists who worked on Stonehenge, you know, when they're being very frank and honest, they're like, we just don't know. And we're never going to figure some of these out because we haven't found the, the book <laughs> or the stone tablet that says, hey, we built Stonehenge to, you know, to figure out our crop in the weather cycle, you know, so we could grow our crops or to worship, uh, you know, our, our pantheon of gods or whatever they are. So we have covered megaliths and we have talked about megaliths for a long time. You know, usually our idea is to cover three of these, but since we've, we've already talked about three megaliths, I mean, that's almost an episode. Yeah, right yeah there, there we go. We're, we're, we've covered. <laughs> yeah, almost. But let's talk about at least one more if we can get it in and, you know, maybe two if we can try to. Um, I was searching around your blog on Molten Sulfur and I found uh, your post about Icelandic beasts and uh, these come to us from kind of an ancient or a, a medieval or renaissance type historian. Isn't that right? Yeah. So uh, these, these uh, odd sea monsters uh, come from the, the first atlas ever published in Europe. It was published in the year 1570 uh, by a Belgian man named Abraham Ortelius. Um, it's, it's really, it's a very good atlas. Um, you know, the, the, it's, it's quite accurate relative to uh, the maps that had been published before, like Ortelius did a, a very good job. Um, but it's also uh, a little bit of a, of a here be dragons sort of, of atlas uh, because Ortelius went ahead and illustrated his various, uh, his various maps in this atlas uh, with 
all kinds of fanciful monsters, uh, including uh, descriptions of the monsters in the text. Like, here's what this monster is. Like, you better watch out because it'll get you. Um, and his, in my opinion, the the best page in the book for monsters is the map of Iceland. Uh, and really, it's it's a very good map of Iceland. Uh, you know, you, you look at it and you're like, boy, that's sure Iceland. Um, but the waters around Iceland are teeming with these bizarre sea monsters uh, that... Uh, that he then helpfully labels and calls out and explains what it is. So um, you have kind of your your typical whale. One of them is is your typical medieval or European Renaissance uh, uh, view of what a whale looks like, uh, which is to say um, it has uh, scales and it has kind of a fish tail, uh, but then on the front end of it, it has uh, it has paws like like lion's paws instead of flippers, uh, and this particular one has uh, the head of a boar, like what is very clearly a boar, though a little fangy in the mouth, um, but complete with you know the flat boar's snout, uh, complete with nostrils, and then the thing that makes it like ah yes, this is what. European illustrators of the era thought whales looked like um, is that it has a blowhole. It has two kind of pipes sticking out of the top of its head uh, and water flows out of these pipes. Um, And yeah, I mean, if you've never seen a whale before and somebody described it to you, I can see you drawing it like this, and this is just kind of how whales were drawn. Um, and uh, Ortelius tells us that this whale, which he calls the greatest kind of whales, uh, is very sneaky. It's very secretive. You don't see it very often. Uh, and because it's so big, uh, it can't really chase down fish to eat them. So instead, it it has to use, quote, a natural wile and subtlety, close quote, in order to catch and eat fish. And he does not explain what that means. Um, but uh, I I love the idea that this this isn't just like some horrific abomination of nature. This is a sneaky horrific abomination of nature, and um, you know I can definitely see this whale like being sneaky in such a way where like he floats on the surface and you think he's an island and you you know d- you you tie up your ship to to this island and you go wandering around on the island but then it turns out the island is a whale and just like in Sinbad the Sailor or St. Brendan uh the you know the, the whale dives and you all drown and then he eats you and you know good job on the sneakiness I think that idea of the kind of the island that is a creature um, now, you know, while it is in mythology and folklore and some ancient literature, or medieval literature, I think it is, I, I think it could be translated right into a game very easily. And I think that uh, all of the players, unless they're just a uh, uh, bat player or something, is, is going to, they're just going to love it because uh, that would add, I don't know, it just ad- it seems like it just adds just an extra element of the mythical to your world with, with like hardly any effort at all. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So uh, kind of the, the, of this batch of monsters, there's a lot of monsters on this map, and we're not going to talk about all of them because that is altogether too many monsters. And frankly, a lot of them are just like, this one's also a whale. <laughs> um, but my favorite of these monsters is a creature that Ortelius uh, calls Scoutuvalur. Um, and Scoutuvalur is kind of like a, a ray or a skate, you know, which has a, a flat, a, a wide, flat, skinny body. Uh, Scoutuvalur is kind of like that, uh, but he's kind, kind of a, a dog's head at the front. Um, but instead of, like, on a ray or a skate, that wide, flat body that he, the, the, the ray waves up and down to essentially fly through the water... Um, it's all muscle. It's just a sheet of muscle. Um, in, with Scoutuvalur, uh, it appears to be more like the wings of a bat. It's It's got kind of these, these rays uh, coming out, kind of like the, the rays in the fin of a fish, uh, with something, it's not entirely clear what, but something stretched between the rays. Uh, and in his description of our good friend Scoutuvalur, uh, Ortelius implies that Scoutuvalur can manipulate these rays individually, kind of like you or I would manipulate our fingers or a bat 
would manipulate his fingers that are inside his wing. Um, and that as a result, Scoutuvalor can kind of slip his body that is also his hand under the hull of a ship and slowly overturn it. Um, and so, you know, you could have a fight with Scoutuvalor on this, this, this ship, which is definitely not the sort of thing you would want to have every time. But as, as a one-off, it could be like, oh, that was, that was different. That was fun. Um, where Scoutuvalor, flipping over the ship is kind of all he can do. Right, he doesn't have claws. I guess he does technically have a mouth he could bite with. But I feel like once he's engaged and slowly flipping over the ship, like that's it. That's all he's doing. And so you have your players have X many rounds to drive Scoutuvalor off before the ship flips over. And every round it tips a little further, and eventually it's going to tip all the way over, and everyone will drown, and that'll sure be a shame. Um, so you have to deal a certain amount of damage to Scoutuvalor before he flips the ship over. Enough damage uh, that he is like, nope, this isn't worth it, I'm swimming away. Or, uh, alternately, if, if your player's like, mm, just sort of fire lightning bolts in, until he's driven off, that doesn't sound very fun. Um, they can come up with some sneaky plan, right? Like, what are we going to do to drive Scout Tuvalor off? Well, he's got kind of a dog's head. Like, maybe we could poke him in the eye. Uh, you know, hey, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Ranger. Hey, Mr. Gunfighter. Do you think you could get that guy in the eye? Maybe maybe drive him off that way? So I really like Scout Tuvalor. I think, I think he's really different. I think he's unusual. I think he's memorable. Yeah, I, I thought he was r- really really just an interesting monster or creature when I was, uh, when I was reading your post on it and, and looking at some of the uh, illustrations of it. Now, you know, we, we are talking about these monsters, obviously, you know, working a monster into your campaign shouldn't be a problem for any game master because uh, I think I, 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 I'll just make up a number, but I would venture to say 90 to 99% of role-playing games are like slaughtering monsters, uh, you know, or hunting <laughs> monsters. You know, of course, we could take these and and kind of stat them up, and they would be really unique monsters. I mean, it's a wonder that some of these haven't been statted up already because they're really cool, and they add uh, just like you were just describing with that last one. You know, they they have like a special ability. Oh well, it's made to flip over ships. You know, kind of thing. Um, I know I've done it in the past, uh, and I know other game masters may struggle with it sometimes. Sometimes your campaign or your 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 adventures can kind of just become your players, you know, the group goes someplace, fight a monster, go someplace, fight a monster, go someplace, fight a monster. Uh, do you have any advice on kind of breaking out of that cycle? Like, but like you want to have a monster here. How do you break out of the cycle with just like, okay, well last week's monster was a challenge rating 11 and now this week's one's a challenge rating 14 or something like that. So that's a, a terrific question and something that I have found myself falling into that trap, right? Uh, mm-hmm. I, th- this was a decade ago at this point. Um, so, you know, great. I guess I'm older than I realized. Um, but one of my players at one point made a, a joke at me like, you know, oh, well, we only ever, you know, we might as we were playing fourth edition Dungeons and Dragons, which had daily powers. And he's sort of like, well, we might as well just throw all our daily powers at the sky because we only ever have one combat encounter per session anyway. We always have exactly one. We never have fewer. We never have more. So throw all your dailies at it. I was like, oh my God, I hadn't realized. But yeah, that's 100% true. I always have exactly one combat encounter. Um, and so what I did to get away from that, uh, from from that rut that clearly my, my players were starting to get annoyed by, was to uh, change up not just the structure of the adventure, but the purpose of the adventure. Because as long as your adventure is just, there is a bad guy over there, I'm going to need you to make there not be a bad guy over there, then you can do various ways of putting lipstick on a pig and try to change it up a little bit. But fundamentally, it's really just going to boil down to the PCs travel from point A to point B. They get to point B. There is a fight. Adventure's over. And that's repetitive. Uh, It's not necessarily bad. That's a a standard for a reason, but it is repetitive. So you have to find other things for the players to be doing than just go over there, make there not be bad people over there anymore. Um, And that's where you start to get into a lot more uh, political games, 
Uh, that's when you start digging into the backstories that the players hand you uh, to see like, okay, what plot hooks did they either deliberately or unintentionally hand me that maybe we're going to address that uh, this session. But don't, don't just, don't try to change the, the like, well, we go to a place and, and kill a monster. That's the symptom. Go after the cause. And the cause is all of your sessions wind up playing out the same because all of your, your adventure hooks, all of your drives to adventure are the same. Change that. Yeah, no, I think that's great advice. Um, I apologize if that is not even remotely what you were trying to get me to say, but by (laughs) God, I've said it. (laughs) No, I wasn't trying to get you to say anything other than what, you know, how you handle it as a game master, because I I know you run a lot of games. So, um, and, and like you said, I think it is easy. And I I admitted this as well, right? It's easy to fall into that because sometimes, you know, what we're doing is we, we need a monster because that's fun, you know? Killing monsters is fun. I mean, it's yeah, fun. everybody you know? has a good time. Yeah, everybody has a good time. It's a blast. But, you know, if it just becomes kind of an episodic kind of thing, well, okay, yeah, you know, yeah, we're going to have, or even sometimes, like you said, there's one combat encounter. Well, sometimes, right, you will have, well, there's going to be like, three weak monsters and then a tough one so all your players know okay well at first we're going to use cantrips then you know on the third one we might use one spell slot but then we know there's a more powerful one and then we'll unleash all of our spell slots on that one you know at the end and um i just think ways of breaking out of some of those little you know, some of the, you know, I mean, obviously they make, you know, running a game a little bit easier, you know, in some cases, but um, they also make it, uh, you know, not only dull for the players, but they make it dull for the game masters. And I, I think it's important to, you know, if you kind of realize you're just like, oh, you know, my sessions haven't been feeling, you know, too good. I'm kind of a little maybe dreading kind of running a game. It might be because you're stuck in a rut and you've just been kind of doing the same thing over and over again. And, um, you know, it's time to kind of break out of that and try to uh, do something, you know, just a little bit different, you know, give the monster just a little bit of a spin uh, in some other way or tie them to their backstory. Um, like you were mentioning there in the the character's backstory, I think, um, I know there's a type of player who doesn't want to, doesn't want, you know, to give the game master anything and they don't want to, you know, have, you know, they have their character, well, they're an orphan and they were raised in an orphanage, but that orphanage already burned down. And so, you know, so the game master has no hooks or anything, but, you know, it could be as simple as, you know, like say looking at the movie uh, Jaws, if you have a, a, you know, the, the, uh, Sheriff Brody in Jaws, the main character in Jaws, right? What is his problem? He has to face a water monster and he's afraid to go on the water, right? So if we can, if our players have given us any little thing that we can give and we can tie that to their background, then that monster then takes on a new dimension of terror, right? Because keeping with Jaws, right? Quint, he's fought a whole bunch of sharks. So he is not necessarily worried about it at the beginning of going after this shark, although he respects them and knows about it. But Chief Brody, right? He is, he doesn't, doesn't want to be on the water, let alone have a man eating beast underneath his feet when he is out (laughs) on the water, right? Imagine that. Yeah. Imagine that. So, you know, those, I think, you know, tying in something like that can give, um, uh, the combat just a little bit more dimension than you know you know looking at opening up the monster manual to page you know seventy four or whatever it is and you know and just like throwing monsters at them and um and I thought that was kind of interesting when I was bringing up this why I wanted to talk about kind of like the Icelandic beasts is because uh those pictures of them and some of the kind of the the kind of archaic almost thoughts about some of these creatures um, are are just almost reading like a monster manual from, you know, uh, 300 years ago or whatever it was. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's his, his short little descriptions of these, these various creatures are definitely written like, uh, uh, like, like a, a super short monster manual. Yeah. And of course, like you said, he has many more and they have some really fantastic illustrations with them. And um, any of those could just be thrown into a, uh, a, uh, 
a, a seafaring campaign or any time that the PCs go on a ship or anything like that. Or um, obviously they could be used, uh, you know, they could be brought up to modern times or Call of Cthulhu or anything like that because uh, uh, they're a mystery, right? Uh, the creature, what was it? It was uh, wily and subtle, right? So yes. it's, it's, it's just been hiding. We just haven't seen it. You know, it hid through all the 20th century and we just haven't seen it. And uh, just waiting there for food to come into its mouth or whatever. And it just so happens to be your, your, uh, your uh, PCs uh, have, to, uh, have to go right across its path to get to whatever goal that they're, they're looking for. Yeah, Abraham Ortelli has tried to warn us, but would we listen? No. No, no. These, uh, the, those, those creatures are out there. They've just been, they've just been uh, doing their own thing, and they're just not concerned with us. And uh, we just thought they were rocks and islands and stuff, and uh, here we go. <laughs> All right. Well, Tristan, we have been going on. Do you want to tackle a third one? or you want uh, to I, one? Do, do, do we want to try to make this a challenge? Can, can we do David Alroy in 10 minutes? Can we do David Alroy in 10 minutes? Well, uh, wh- who is he real quick? And we'll see if we can. Okay, so uh, David Alroy uh, it was a, uh, a fellow who died around the year 1160, uh, and he was a, f- a false Jewish messiah. Uh, he was someone who, who, who was Jewish, said he was the messiah, and events pretty quickly demonstrated that, that he was not. Um, but it's a, it's a really wonderful story. So um, his, his name was not David Alroy originally. He was born Menahem bin Solomon. Uh, and he was born uh, on the, the edge of the Khwarezmid Persian Empire uh, in a place that today is uh, part of Iraqi Kurdistan. And he, he, he grew up in the, the Jewish community in, in this, this town of Ahmadiyya. And uh, of course, the people that he reported to were the local rabbis. The local rabbis exerted enormous political power over uh, Amadea's Jewish community, no surprise. Um, and the local rabbis were appointed by the head rabbi of the Khwarezmid Empire, no surprise there. What, where the surprise comes in is that the head rabbi of the Khwarezmid Empire was not appointed by the Khwarezmid Emperor. Rather, he was appointed by someone named the Exilarch. And the Exilarch was the, 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 theoretically the leader of all the Jews living in the Muslim world. And the Exilarch did not work for the Khwarezmid Empire. He worked for the Abbasid Empire, which was a, a rival empire. The, the Khwarezmids are Persian, and the Abbasids at the time uh, were uh, a mix of uh, Arab and Seljuk Turkish. And the Khwarezmids and the Abbasids were, you know, were, were rivals. Um, they didn't necessarily always get along, but nonetheless, um, theoretically, all the, the, all the Jews in the Khwarezmid Empire reported ultimately to the exile arc. So even though they were Khwarezmid subjects, they were kind of also Abbasid subjects. It's complicated. But anyway, so David Alroy, uh, he goes to, to, to Baghdad. He studies under the exile arc. Baghdad is the head of the, the Abbasid Caliphate. Uh, he studies under the exile arc. Uh, and then when he gets home to Ahmadiyya, uh, he announces that he is the Messiah. And we, our, our primary source here is a guy named Benjamin of Tudela. And he doesn't tell us this explicitly, but maybe we can read between the lines and kind of infer that what's going on here is the exile arc, who is a good Abbasid, uh, is trying to exert some influence to, to cause a little trouble for the Khwarezmids, who are theoretically his rivals. Um, and so here's, here's David, uh, here, here is Menahem ben Solomon announcing, nope, new name, my name is David Alroy now, I am the Messiah, and um, all of you, my Jewish brothers and sisters here in Ahmadiyya, we need to rise up against the Khwarezmids, uh, and then once we've done that, we are going to march straight over to Jerusalem and take it back from those pesky crusaders. The Khwarezmid emperor hears about this. He is understandably less than thrilled, uh, summons David Alroy to, uh, to the capital, um, and David Alroy goes very willingly. He denies nothing. Um, but while he, according to Benjamin of Tudela, while David Alroy was studying in, in Baghdad under the exile arc, um, he uh, 
he studied a lot of magical texts as well. And our, our source differentiates between religious texts, which is all about miracles, and magical texts, which are, are secular. There's fundamentally, uh, it's fundamentally secular in the same way that, that philosophy is secular or alchemy is secular or a healing poultice is secular. Ditto with... Um, ditto with with magic. And so David Alroy is is very well schooled in both religious miracles and in secular magic. And uh, he pretty immediately breaks out of prison by just teleporting to the throne room of the Khorizmid emperor, says, ha ha, I have escaped thanks to my secular magic, turns invisible, uh, runs on down to the river, puts his shawl on the river, and then just walks across it to the other side, thanks to his secular magic, and then hightails it right back to Amadea. It's a 10-day journey. He makes it in one day, uh, quote, by the power of the ineffable name, close quote. So this then is a miracle. It's not magic. Um, Quarzman Emperor is, is having absolutely none of this, um, and he turns to international hardball. Uh, he writes a letter to the exile arc uh, saying, look, get your man David to knock this nonsense off. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to do some seriously bad things over here, uh, and I'm going to kill every single Jew in the Quarzman Empire if you don't get David to knock this off, and you don't want that, so get him to knock it off. And the, uh, the exile arc, uh, again, we, we don't know if he put David up to this or not, but now he's got to get David down from this. Uh, and so he, he gets all the big scholars, all the major Jewish scholars, uh, to write letters to David saying like, no, I, I don't think you're the Messiah, David. Uh, you know, I'm an astronomer, and there should be these particular astronomical signs if, if you're the Messiah, and I'm not seeing them so. Or, you know, boy, I've studied a lot of texts, and the texts say the Messiah should have these features, and you don't seem to have these features, so I guess you're not the Messiah. Anyway, uh, it was a good attempt uh, by the exile arc. David doesn't listen. Uh, the Khorasmid Emperor pays off David's father-in-law, gives him a bunch of money. David's father-in-law assassinates the would-be Messiah, uh, and that's the end of that. Uh, the Khorasmid Emperor uh, raises an army to march on Amadea to put down the revolt. Uh, the exile arc, uh, understandably, panics because he knows what's about to happen next, um, and uh, raises uh, manages to scrape together enough money to pay off the Khorasmid Emperor and be like, no, please don't kill all the Jews in Amadea. That is bad news bearers. We don't want that. Like, take your money, go home. And the Khorasmid Emperor basically says, thank you. This is what I wanted all along. Thank you for the money. You know, now David Alroy is gone. I'm going to go home. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there's some more details in there, but that's that's essentially the end of it. Is It's this weird kind of international politics thing by way of uh, of of religious uprising um, of a minority group in one particular city uh, where they might have been a majority. I'm, I'm not clear on that in Amadea specifically. And you've got this this weird international hardball going on between David, the exile arc, the Abbasid caliph, and the Khorasmid emperor, uh, all kind of playing four-dimensional international politics chess against one another uh, in a, a political setup that is very different, I think, from, from what I am accustomed to seeing in RPG adventures. Did I make 10 minutes? <laughs> yeah, I think you did. That was really cool. So if we're playing D&D, &D, how, how do you envision just using that if we're playing D&D? &D? So uh, if we're doing D&D, &D, uh, the way I would do it is tell your players, hey, there's this guy over here. Uh, you don't have to tell him you're basing this guy on David Alroy, but you're basing him on David Alroy. Um, and your patron, the, the quest giver, the guy who, who gives you your quests, uh, he says, uh, hey, could you do me a favor and go check check this guy out? Is he the real deal? Um, is he the real chosen one? And if, if you want to get fancy with it, you can even, like, a couple sessions before this, insert a prophecy and be like, oh, yeah, everybody knows about the prophecy. And, you know, David Alroy is now claiming to be the, the, the fulfillment of this, this prophecy. And uh, your PCs can go there and then they can decide for themselves. You don't have to tell them, like, oh, this guy is the real deal. No, he's definitely not. He's definitely deluded. Like, yeah, let your, let your characters figure out for themselves whether they, they think this guy's legit. Uh, and then let events play out. Um, it can be a very powerful jamming technique to say, I don't know how things are going to play out because the players are involved, but if the players literally do nothing, if they sit on their hands, this is how events are going to go. And then 
as your players are doing things, as, as your characters are doing things, um, you then just figure out how that impacts the course of events. Um, and that's how I would do it is, you know, the, the, maybe your PCs decide that he's legit and you say, okay, well, you know, now they're working for him and the my version of the Corsamid Emperor is going to go ahead and buy off David Alroy's father-in-law and are the PCs able to stop the assassination? Um, you know, if they are, then things go very differently. Uh, if they're not, then things kind of end there. Uh, you know, David Alroy gets thrown in prison. Do, if your PCs thought, hey, this guy's legit, do they want to break him out of prison? On the other hand, maybe they thought, no, I think I think this guy's full of it. I don't think he's legit at all. Um, <laughs> are they the ones who, who go try to, to bring him into prison? Or when he escapes from prison, are they able to go grab him and bring him back and maybe set up an anti-magic shell around his around his, his cell so that he can't do this, you know, I've multi-classed as both wizard and cleric uh, nonsense <laughs> again. Um, and uh, yeah, just like know how things would go if your PCs don't get involved and then let them get involved and see where things go from there. I think just uh, like a lot of the things that we talk about that uh, kind of taking some of this real history would just add an element to uh, really any tabletop RPG campaign uh, that a lot of players and a lot of GMs haven't kind of faced before. And um, because, I mean, how could you even come up with something like that if, you know, that complex by just thinking about it on your own other than reading a short, uh, you know, a short article about it, you know, a real historical event or situation gives us so much more detail than something that we could think of while we're, you know, driving someplace or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the bit about like, hey, I, you know, I'm sure the emperor of all the people in my empire, well, except those guys over there, like those guys are only sort of mine, and they're kind of also not mine. And, you know, they kind of don't take orders from me, but they're also kind of my subjects. Like, that is a layer of complexity and, and nuance that, yeah, totally happens in real life, but is is often hard to, to think about when you're, you're just trying to figure something out for your, your fictional RPG campaign. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, Tristan, uh, we kind of, uh, this episode is jam packed with ideas for people to, uh, uh, to just drop in their campaigns. Why don't you tell people where they can find you online? Uh, so you can find me, uh, at, uh, moltensulfur.com or just Google molten sulfur. That's the, the molten sulfur blog. You can also follow me on Twitter, uh, at molten sulfur, uh, and search for me on Facebook again, molten sulfur. Basically if it's on the internet and it's using the molten sulfur brand name, it's me and you can find me there. All right. Well, thank you for stopping by the podcast again. I look forward to another chat with you where we can uh, dive into some more uh, wild uh, history. So uh, thanks for coming on the show again. Uh, genuinely my pleasure. I'm looking forward to the next time. All right. There you have it, guys. Wow. That was a huge conversation with tons of information. Tristan brings a wealth of historical knowledge to each and every episode that he is on, and I just love chatting with him. As you can see, there is so much that we can learn from actual history and folklore and mythology that we can just take all of that stuff and just throw it into our games and add weight and reality to our RPG sessions and campaigns. Now, as I mentioned in the show notes for this episode, you will find links to Tristan's blog as well as his books that are available on drivethroughrpg.com. Support his work at Molten Sulfur Blog and Molten Sulfur Press. We need independent creators like him to be able to thrive so we can get amazing content that they bring to the table. If you want some free stuff, head over to dicegeeks.com slash free. You'll get 10 free dungeon maps. You'll never miss an episode of the show. And every Friday, you will get an email from me letting you know what is going on here at Dice Geeks. Now, guys, if you like this show, if you like interviews like the one I did today with Tristan, please consider supporting the show in some way. You can leave a review. You can rate it. You can share it. You can subscribe. If you are able to financially support the show, you could head over to patreon.com slash dicegeeks and find out how to support the show financially there. 
anything that you do to help support the show is greatly appreciated. Now, I thank you so much for listening. And until next Wednesday, keep gaming.